Chairman Joe Simons and two other Republicans approved the terms the two Democrats voted against. Mike Frost, yep. Washington. Governor Gretchen Whitmer is moving to make Michigan the first state to ban flavored e-cigarettes. The Democrat announced today she's ordered the state health department to issue emergency rules. It will prohibit the sale and misleading marketing of flavored nicotine and vaping products. More of these stories at townhall.com. The following is an American Matters Media production. The views expressed do not necessarily represent those of the station or its advertisers, although we think they should. But that's the opinion of America Matters Media. Hello and welcome to Talking Truth to Power, Nevada's Freedom Talk Radio. I am your host, Brendan Trainer, and my co-host, Leland Fagri. Uh, bright and early, well, not that early, but it's early for us sometimes. How was your trip down from the lake? It was uh, very seasonal, I think. Mm -hmm. It felt more like August than September, but you know, we're right on that synapse of... Yeah, this, I think we're blessed here in northern Nevada. We usually have a very nice Indian summer, and I'm looking forward oh, to it Oh, we'll again. get one for sure, yeah. 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 All right. Well, well, there's uh, quite a bit to talk about as usual during the week. Uh, there is. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd like to start with a little sit rep about uh, what's going on in the Middle East. Because a little what? Sit rep situation ah, representation. Okay. When, you, when you hyphenate, you always throw me off. <laughs> uh, there's some amazing events going on that uh, you know the mainstream media is simply not covering. So we might as well. Uh, dig into it a little bit. Um, the fact is that the uh, war in Yemen, uh, despite uh, the fact that America has been fueling it, um, and with uh, some late uh, objections by Congress, is uh, winding down. A lot of people are, may not be aware of that, but um, if they were even aware of the war in Yemen in the first place. No, they're not. <laughs> I can answer that question. Yeah. But um, the poorest country in the Middle East has uh, basically defeated the kingdom, the richest countries allied against it. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, the USA, all extremely wealthy countries, and uh, little Yemen and the, the Houthis have apparently uh, fought th them to a standstill. And uh, Saudi Arabia is about ready to sue for peace. In fact, they have asked for talks. And it's, um, you know, there's still going to be bloodshed. It's, these things take time. And uh, although, again, the United States could end it virtually overnight if we officially withdrew all our support for Saudi Arabia. But uh, I'm not holding my breath for that. You better not. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get blue pretty quickly. But um, so uh, the thing is that Hezbollah, you know, those evil militia in uh, Lebanon, who did so much to uh, defeat ISIS, although we grab all the um, um, you know, credit for it. They um, have been bringing in some drones. Uh, I don't know whether they manufacture them there or they, they're pre-assembled outside, but they've managed to smuggle in some drones. And, uh, and they're using them. Yeah, they have uh, hit some Saudi oil uh, assets. And that's uh, one thing that the Saudis are afraid of is losing their oil assets. So, uh, and then the United Arab Emirates, um, MBZ uh, is apparently smarter than MBS. And they have uh, basically pulled out and they've even attacked some uh, Saudi aligned government forces. And the way people can turn on each other in wars like this is, is sometimes amazing. Shocking. Yeah. Shocking, I'm telling you. <laughs> Especially in that part of the world. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> but they feel that uh, they uh, have installed a puppet government in South Lebanon and South Yemen, which is not where the Houthis are, and, but where most of the little bit of oil that Yemen has compared to these countries is. And so they... Uh, Do they actually produce it? I, have they I, been produ they producing They have some it? oil fields in the eastern part e closest to Saudi Arabia. Even during yeah. this uh, civil war? I don't war? know about during the civil war. Yeah. Not, yeah but they, they uh, are turning their attention to Lib Libya. They are more heavily involved in Libya. So they've pulled out, and now Saudi Arabia is apparently not going to be able to uh, hold on for long. 
And so um, we are the one of the greatest uh, humanitarian disasters uh, is going to come to an end, and we could make it come faster, but I doubt if we will. Well, there's another factor here, and that is that 60% of, of any new oil mm -hmm. that enters the market now originates from the United States. Mm -hmm. So the Saudi Arabian influence over the petrol you know, dollar scheme yeah. is, is waning very quickly. Yes, and don't forget Russia and, and yeah. so on. Yeah, so then... Um, so uh, you know, w the, will the uh, will the world remember the fifty thousand Yemeni children who starved or died of typhus as uh, being worth it? Like our, our former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright said about the children killed in Iraq for the uh, during the no-fly zone era. We'll see, but uh, the UN is already uh, accusing the U.S., France, and England of being war criminals. I'll take the other side of that bet. Okay. Yeah, I don't think we'll remember it. Yep. So, uh, has um, other uh, things that are going on in the world that we're not hearing much about is that uh, war is uh, becoming more imminent between Israel and Lebanon, that is Hezbollah. Uh, again, uh, you didn't hear much about it, but uh, but I think it was a week ago. The You're talking weekend, about the other democracy in, in yeah, the Middle East? Yeah, the other democracy in the Middle East that has people from all different religions in its government. But uh, Israel, a couple of weeks ago, attacked Syria and Lebanon. They fired drones, uh, probably from offshore, uh, that uh, struck uh, the Hezbollah headquarters in Beirut, the capital of Lebanon, although no one was killed. They also attacked uh, another, uh, uh, what they called Iranian um, uh, Revolutionary Guard outpost near Damascus in Syria. And uh, they may have attacked uh, Iran, although there's some, uh, Iraq as well, although there's some dispute about that. Some people are claiming that they were just old ammo dumps that blew up in the heat. But mm -hmm. we, so we're not sure about that one. But they. They did uh, attack at least two countries, and Hezbollah, uh, the, their leader, uh, the very competent Saeed Hassan Nasrali, has said that their, Israel will pay a price. And he said that uh, Hezbollah has the ability with its uh, rockets to reach in deep into Israel, and not with those little Scud uh, 1960s-era rockets that barely do any damage at all. But Hezbollah rockets can do some damage. So... Uh, the funny thing is that uh, on the border, with in the disputed area, the farmland there in southern Lebanon, and uh, the Israelis are putting dummies in their tanks. And I find that hard. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that in, uh, snipers. Hi everybody, this is Sharon Oran, and I'm here for Coffee with Sharon, the newest, hottest radio show at Northern Nevada. So why don't you join me on Thursday, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. on my new weekly show, when we're going to have everybody that is somebody, and everybody that you didn't know was somebody, joining me over here for Coffee with Sharon, talking about Northern Nevada, our local politics, and what's happening in all of the state. So tune in Thursday. 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. I'll be here. Will you? Brought to you in part by Michael's Reno Power Sports. This is America, America Matters, Matters Media, Media on AM 1180 KCKQ, a Lotus Broadcast Station, the, the power, power of radio since 1967. Unable to listen to the whole show? A recording of today's program will be available later today. Visit AmericaMatters.us and click on the podcast link. Now back to the show. Hello, welcome back to Talking Truth to Power, Nevada's Freedom Talk Radio. I'm here with uh, Leland Jeff uh, Fagri. My name is Brendan Trainer, and we were talking about the Middle East because uh, with uh, Hurricane uh, Doreen uh, crowding out the news, and with the normal reluctance of the mainstream media to tell the truth about what's going on over there. <laughs> You should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> you know, we we really haven't been getting the the real picture over there. So, you know, you know, seventy uh, percent of of the Bahamas is underwater. Wow. The, the yeah, I know. So I just can't imagine that. Yeah. Uh, so we we our our hearts and prayers go out to the people of the Bahamas, of course, and I hope that we'll be able to get them some real aid and and have uh, they can rebuild their country. But uh, back to the Middle East, um, you know. Uh, People don't fear the Israeli army that much anymore. Um, 
Uh, Martin Van Cleveland is um, a w uh, one of the world's foremost military experts, and he is a Dutchman, but he lives in Tel Aviv and works at from the University of Tel Aviv. And, and he is saying that the Israeli army is becoming very soft, that they're becoming a social justice warrior army. Mm -hmm. And they have uh, too many women in there. They have too many... Uh, the Israeli people don't like casualties. They get very upset if uh, you know any, any any of their sons are killed in the war, and in war. So well, it's that, been a long time since they were in combat. Right, and they they won the '67 war, which was their big landmark war. Yahweh approved of what they were doing and let them win the war. Yes, he did. And then the seventy or they. Or? <laughs> It or whatever, yeah. The Yahweh. 73 war, they technically won, but they didn't really, it didn't really affect their status that much. And then since then, they haven't really won a war. Uh, Hezbollah, of course, uh, kicked them out of Lebanon in 82 when they occupied all of Lebanon. And one incident in involved in that occupation, of course, was the car bombing of the U.S. Marines when Reagan uh, intervened over there. Mm -hmm. And uh, then in 2006, they tried to attack Lebanon, and Lebanon uh, fought back. Uh, Hezbollah fought back, and they didn't even use their best troops, according to them. Their best troops were aligned uh, around Beirut in case the Israelis broke through, but they didn't break through. The Hezbollah forces in uh, the poorest part of Lebanon, the Shia-dominated southern part, defeated uh, them and drove them back. So uh, there's a lot of question about how effective the uh, Israeli army really is anymore. And uh, so that's why Bibi keeps uh, hoping that the U.S. will get involved and do his, you know, he wants to lead from behind, as Obama used to say. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, we have to be very careful. Pat Buchanan had another column this week about we can't let uh, Bibi uh, drag us into a war in the Middle East, and I I hope Donald Trump knows that because he I you know it's well thought that another war in the Middle East would kill his chances for re-election. I don't think he wants to go there, but we'll see. Um, well, that's uh, the election is uh, what the seventeenth of September of next month. So. Oh yeah, for Bibi. Yeah. Yeah. And you know it's it's expected he'll win despite his problems. He's under indictment. He could go to jail, which is not unusual. One thing about the Israeli government, they do put corrupt officials in, j in jail. And, um, and he has to align himself with some even more unsavory characters to win <laughs> the re-election. You mean for, for a parliamentary the majority? Far, yeah, the far, some of the far-right sort of parties are even sc uh, scarier than Likud is. So. Yeah, coalition type. Yeah, yeah. right. So anyway, uh, we'll see if... Um, if Hezbollah can uh, win the standoff against Israel, and I might, I'm betting that they probably can. Now, Russia is uh, almost uh, ready to finally free Idlib province. Idlib province is the area near um, the, uh, uh, the northeastern part. This is the area where every time uh, the Syrian Arab army won a victory against the uh, uh, Takfiris, the insurgents, uh, some of them were allowed to surrender and join the army or otherwise become civilian, while others were allowed to keep uh, a weapon and, and flee to Idlib. So you've got the hardcore of the hardcore here, those who refused to surrender. Mm -hmm. And the Western media, well, we don't see much of it on, on our TV. I know the BBC has been covering it, and it's all about the Russian atrocities, and they e they even have pictures of the white helmets scurrying to and fro. Yeah, I saw some pictures Yeah, of the white helmets. Yeah. yeah, taking children into or out of buildings. Who knows where they're taking them? Yeah. <laughs> they're posing them, getting them ready to pose another photo op, I would imagine. But So um, the uh, uh, Russia and Turkey has been completely humiliated in the in that country, I remember a year ago, people were worrying about Erdogan or uh, thinking that he was uh, talking about establishing a new caliphate, and uh, there was talk about him threatening the Balkans, and like Turkey normally does, and mm -hmm. so on. And uh, it seemed to have some legitimacy at the time. Yeah, yeah, but not not uh, currently. No, and he, uh, the mayor of uh, uh, Ankara, is an enemy of his now. He was elected. So he's got a little resistance on his on his uh, rear, and he's um, 
He is uh, becoming, uh, you know, uh, more and more friendly with Russia. He accepted the S-400 uh, air defense system despite uh, the U.S. protests. And the U.S. said we would not sell him the F-15 fighters. You know, and please, Bear Rabbit, don't throw me into that briar patch. <laughs> I mean, the S-15 yeah. could barely uh, know, it's, <laughs> stay, it's antiquated. keep in service. Uh, uh, the F-35, I mean, the well, F-35 well, I think, I think is, that are money-sucking NATO, machines. NATO should just be dismantled, and then Erdogan is on his own. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so he was uh, recently seen in Russia, and Russia's trying to sell him their new S-57 fighter jets, which appear to be pretty slick, you know, I have to admit. And uh, the picture, uh, the photo op was uh, Putin bought him an ice cream outside of Moscow. I saw that. I saw that. <laughs> so, I, didn't, uh, I didn't see the picture, but I, I didn't yeah. read about it. Yeah. So, uh, but then I, I read today that Erdogan is talking about how Turkey should have nuclear weapons. <laughs> so we never know what this guy is. He's, he's a slippery eel, I'll tell you. He really is. Yes. Yeah. And we should just let him go. Uh -huh. We shouldn't try to call him an ally. No. And, but it's interesting that, um, you know, do you know, uh, remember John Paul Jones, the famous American admiral? Yeah, the John Paul Jones, the keyboard player for Led Zeppelin? <laughs> no. Is that John Paul Jones? <laughs> no. The American admiral, the USS oh, Constitution, oh, that Old Jones. Ironsides. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for all of you who know anything about history, you might remember John Paul Jones, but he, he actually served in uh, Tsar uh, Catherine the Great's Navy and fought against the Ottoman Empire. And Russia's done a pretty good job of checking them and keeping them off of Europe uh, for quite a while. And it looks like they off may... Off their doorstep. Yeah, yeah. Putin may be playing the same role here. So... Um, it looks that way. Yeah. So, and then there was another interesting thing where a building that contained some of the top Al-Qaeda-affiliated leaders. Um, now, you know, they're called Al-Qaeda, they're called Al-Nusra, they're called all different things, but everybody agrees they're affiliated with Al-Qaeda. Uh, this uh, building was bombed when they were meeting, and uh, several dozen uh, casualties uh, that may have been top Al-Qaeda people were killed. And for a while, for a day or two, nobody knew who did it. And then suddenly the United States claimed that, that we did it. And it's We like to take credit for that. <laughs> well, it's interesting because we very rarely, in the Syrian war, we very rarely attacked the Al-Qaeda. Al Nusra, Al Qaeda, because you know they were supposed to be the moderate rebels against uh, Assad. And then you use the, t the the pronoun we, the collective pronoun we. Uh -huh. We don't even know what we is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Who the hell was fighting over there? I know. I know. We we really it's all so murky, and uh, it's all so. Uh, I'm starting to sound like the Kinks now. And Trump. Uh, what, what which which kinks track are you talking about? Oh, it's, it's, he's a well-adjusted. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, um, twenty. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a great track. <laughs> I have it on my list. I can't. Yeah, it, yeah. But you know, th th this uh, this issue was another ish, uh, area that Trump inherited. This was oh, not yeah. his own. Oh yeah, this was an Obama so operation. Yeah, so he's and Hillary, and, and so Hillary. he's expected to fix it. You know, mm -hmm. and, but instead they'll just blame him for it. So. Yeah. But I, I'm, you know, I'm sitting back here and saying, you know, why would we suddenly... Well-respected man. Yeah, well-respected man about that, yeah. Why should we suddenly uh, attack this building and kill these Al-Qaeda leaders? Could it be we're trying to tie up loose ends and get rid of some potential witnesses? <laughs> you know, I mean, I think, it's just speculation, but... Uh, well, I think if you are putting yourself on a desk at Langley, that's uh -huh. probably exactly what they're trying to do. Yeah. Right. All right, so let's um, go from uh, the kinks to Robert Burns, <laughs> <laughs> the famous Scotch poet who said the what best... What band was he in? <laughs> <laughs> the best laid plans of mice and men gang after glee, which in, uh, if you translate it means, uh, you know, things, sh you know, S-H-I-T happens. For the longest time, I thought that was Shakespeare, but it's not Shakespeare. No. It was, who was that? that Robert was Burns. Yeah. Oh, was it? Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah the but we're not talking about him. That, no. that Robert Burns. No. No, we're talking about Boris now, Boris Johnson. And it seems that, you know, you can switch parties in the House of Commons just by walking over and sitting with I the did, other party. I discovered that yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> the theater in that body is unbelievable, isn't it? I know. It? It's absolutely incredible to watch. I was watching it again this morning. It's oh, really yeah. It's quite remarkable. Uh-huh. And, and uh, all the cheers and the lusty, you know, her, you know uh, it's like, uh, it's almost like watching a, uh, 
you know, British hooligans at a soccer game. Right. You know? <laughs> yeah, it has that uh, aura about it, yeah. Uh, and w what they're up against here it doesn't look good at the moment. Right. You know, they've all s decided that they're going to delay this. And w how is that going to affect the electorate? Now, if Boris Johnson calls a snap election, he wants it by the 15th of October, uh, you know, he, they w it would have to be uh, decided upon by the same body. And I don't think they're going to go for that. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Boy, time to ice. Thanks for joining us. Hi, I'm Leslie Moon. And I'm Shonda Golden. Join us every Wednesday at 3 p.m. for American Women, where we'll talk about issues affecting all... This is America, America Matters Media on AM 1180 KCKQ, a Lotus Broadcast Station, the power of radio since 1967. To join the conversation, call 844-790-TALK. That's 844-790-8255. Now back to the show. Hi, welcome back to Talking Truth to Power, Nevada's Freedom Talk Radio, and we're streaming on our uh, Facebook uh, group page, Talking Truth to Power, so you can tune in to us there. And uh, we're also on YouTube after every show. Mm -hmm. That and is true. Uh, yep. And so uh, you can catch us in all our... Uh, uh, splendor? Splendor. I was <laughs> trying to think of another <laughs> word to go with splendor, but... <laughs> oh, it's splendor, all right. <laughs> <laughs> so we we were talking about the Brexit and how um, the uh, the Scotch. I mean, the Lib Dems most of their power now is in Scotland, and the SNP are anti-Brexit. The Scotch want to stay in the EU, so uh, they are causing a, a good deal of problems for Boris. And so uh, well, we're not the only ones. No, not by any means. <laughs> no, Labour is uh, Jeremy Corbyn is. They're kind of non-committal. Some of them don't want Brexit at all. Some well, of them want. There's about 17 to 20, I think, that uh, don't want uh, to remain in, okay. in the union. And uh, and but they're not a problem for Corbyn because he's got the majority. You know, they'll yeah. do whatever he wants. So. Right. And so, uh, what do you think is is going to be the upshoot of this now? Well, I tell you, I mean, a snap election is in the cards mm -hmm. very clearly. Uh, the uh, uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer was speaking this morning on the Commons floor. He's, he's their version of the Secretary of the Treasury. Right. Yeah. And, you know, he's making it clear that, that the money is there and uh, austerity is over and he's sort of setting the stage for an election. But he's still going to have to get the approval uh, in the Commons itself for a snap election. Right. So I uh, think it's a two-thirds vote, too. I think it is. It's pretty, mm -hmm. pretty, a pretty steep hurdle. And... Uh, you know, the Tories are not behaving well. Most of them are, are globalists uh, to the core. Mm -hmm. And that's the legacy of uh, from John Major on, probably. Right. Uh -huh. um, you know, it's a difficult hurdle for him. But he's, uh, like Trump, you know, he's an iconoclast. And he's uh, doing everything he can to... Um, to be the uh, effectively the the implementation Im to implement the people's decision to b to leave the European Union, right? And he's just facing un insurmountable opposition at this point. You know, it's another reason why you should avoid entangled alliances. Yep, Don't get involved in something. It's going to be so hard to get out of. Hard to get out of them. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> but there is, uh, you know, there's still a glimmer of hope that. Um, there can be some sort of a an electoral solution here because if he can call an election by mid October, he's got time to um, rally the troops, so to speak, by uh, the thirty first, which would uh, which is the deadline for for Brexit. Right. And it's interesting. It'll be interesting to see what Nigel Farage is going to do. Well, that's right. He needs he, Farage yeah. in, in the EU Parliament, and he's yeah. he's st standing in the wings. He's ready to help. You know? mm -hmm. But he wanted to see how this was going to play out before. He stepped into the ring. Right. And so uh, it's, it's one of the most interesting things I've ever seen. Right. And, and this goes back to June of 2016. I couldn't believe that afternoon. I was in Montana when that came down, and I couldn't believe it, that, that they'd actually they decided. <laughs> yeah. You know, the polls were decidedly lopsided against the referendum. Right. And yet, you know, the, the people spoke. Right. Yeah, it was quite something. I mean, the earth shook. Mm-hmm. And it's still shaking. You mean the polls are not always right? Uh, it turns out they're not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
So uh, the struggle goes on for uh, England to step out into the into its new future, uh, aligned back uh, to the future. Back to the future, yeah. yes, it, and uh, maybe without Scotland, and uh, maybe without Northern Ireland, if if the uh, Northern Irish get uh, you know figure out that the p folks in London don't really care about them, they might uh, decide to rejoin the South. And well, he he. Uh, has apparently been speaking to the Taoiseach, and there is a, a backstop uh, arrangement, so mm -hmm. to speak, that would get around a hard border in Northern Ireland, and it would involve agriculture. The, oh. The, the, oh, yeah. the, the UK agricultural uh, uh, industry in the, in the six counties would comply with the EU's uh, ordinances for regulation, and that would likely preclude the need for a hard border. Okay. That's, that's pretty innovative, actually. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, if, if they can figure out something, that, that would be great. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I'm going to be visiting Ireland at the end of this month, and I'm hoping to see, uh, get a sense of what the Irish people think. And so, well, You're we'll see. You're interviewing on the streets? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least some uh, listening and talking. Yeah, you yeah. know, Tiggin Tirgon Grailerin. In, in which pub will you be listening to them <laughs> speaking? Well, would. I'm going to go to Donegal first and hopefully uh, engage in some Gale Talked. Okay. And then um, after you, that, I'm, I'm figuring you, to go to Belfast and finally wind up in Dublin. So you don't speak any Gaelic, do you? Um, I sp uh, like Tirgon. Oh, Tiggin, that's very impressive. You're going grailering. God, that's good. <laughs> Showing off again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Donegal is very nice, and uh, Sligo, uh, south of there, is very nice. So uh, yeah, that's a great part of the country. Yeah. yeah. I'm looking forward to it. I'm starting to get excited. You know, it, before it was like off in the distance. Now I'm starting to get a little excited. So. Mm -hmm. Just wait till you have to pay for it. I know, I know. That that's going to come this weekend. Because Ireland used to be an inexpensive destination, but since they joined the European zone, uh, that, yeah, that's uh, well. That and uh, immigration is a big thing there, you know. Oh yeah. And um, the uh, cultural uh, problems with, uh, in other words, um, again, um, accepting uh, perhaps too many refugees and. Um, I noticed that most of the working girls in Ireland are from other <laughs> European EU uh, countries. Um, How would you have known that? I, you know, I have my, my ways of knowing. <laughs> and, uh, well, you know, it's the same thing in Paris. You know, there aren't that many, uh, you know, people from uh, the Eastern European countries go west in order to make some money. And uh, we see quite a few Spaniards and Italians in Ireland. But the, the main problem is not so much that. It's whether or not the Irish culture will be overwhelmed by, you know, um, Arabs and, you know, uh, refugees from the uh, North Africa and, uh, frankly, other African countries. And uh, it's the same thing as England, you and know. And Germany. And Germany, yeah, yes. Just to a lesser extent, I'm sure. Yes. Yeah. And... Uh, the Irish are becoming, you know, much more liberal than they ever were when I was. Well, much more secular. It's much more secular. Yeah, yeah that's the amazing uh, transition that I've witnessed since. Their president I was there. is a gay Hindu guy. Yeah, I mean, you can't make that up, can <laughs> no. you? No. I mean, no. I'm not sure how. The, not that there's a great deal of the the old school nationalists left in the country. My father-in-law was one of them, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, they they're. They're passing on now, so it's a it's a different place than it used to be. Right, and uh, well, well, we'll see. Um, the um, again, that's something I'm going to be interested in seeing, and just what it, what Ireland looks like now. The last time I was in Dublin, uh, the only the th main thing I noticed was that there was a whole Polish quarter. And yes, you, and you go down there, and there, all the signs were in uh, Polish. That un I understand has uh, grown mm -hmm. significantly. Yeah. So, yeah, so it'd be interesting to see. And, and, you know, of course, you're not against new people coming in, but you just want to preserve as much of the original culture as you oh, can. Oh, that's the, that's the main object, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, you know, speaking of um, talking uh, Gaelic, my great-uncle happened to be John Millington Singe, who was 
the I, I hope I pronounced his last name right. He Boy, was me too. Yeah, he was the uh, <laughs> close friend of William Butler Yeats, and he. Uh, no, he's he's buried in in Sligo. Yes. If you come down to, from Donegal, you can yeah. visit his. I visited his grave there. Yes, yeah. and um, he is known for you know they tried to revive the Irish language and the Irish culture, but uh, when they formed the Abbey Theatre in Dublin, they were often mobs mm -hmm. formed against uh, the plays they were producing That's because the legacy uh, of english yeah D dublin had become so anglicized mm -hmm. yeah that the middle class there didn't appreciate what they were doing actually right. and i don't think that gaelic would have survived e except for the governmental effort uh, and expenditure to save it right you know? and and it apparently is working there seems to be um a, a sort of a renaissance of of uh, Gaelic now in the country. I and yeah, I'd like be interesting to see that. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I know in Dublin uh, the signs are both in English and Gaelic, but I'd, most people speak English. But again, if I had come up to them and started speaking Gaelic, maybe they would have responded. Some would. In Gaelic, yeah, mm -hmm. some would. My mother spoke Gaelic when I was very young, but she gave it up pretty quickly. I don't recall that that much of it. So, mm -hmm. it's um, that's a common story. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I remember we used to um, have visitors over, and we and uh, we visited our relatives over there. But most of them that knew my mother have passed, so mm -hmm. it's well, yeah. it's going to be. Uh, yeah, it, it it's a different it's a different country, uh, and as we mentioned, much more secular than it has ever been. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so it's and that trend is obviously going to continue. Right. Well, all right. So. Um, we have uh, somewhat more to talk about in the last segment of the show. Um, we have the uh, more to deal with um, uh, Jeffrey Epstein and uh, the mysterious Jean-Luc Brunel, mm -hmm. who's... Uh, where is he? That's the problem. <laughs> Nobody knows where he is. And he hasn't been pictured in an In-N-Out burger or anything. In, well, or they don't have In-N-Out burgers in France. Yeah, I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't be surprised if they do. They have McDonald's. So. No, I think they've moved as far east as Texas now. Okay. But that's that's it. That's the extent of their empire, I think. Okay. Yeah. And uh, we can talk a little bit about how uh, Kamala Harris is no longer to be feared. <laughs> well, I made that point several weeks ago after, right. after Tulsi uh, roped that dope. Yeah. So there's nothing left of her and good riddance to her. Thanks yeah. for joining us on Talking Truth to Power. Join the Funtime Theater this fall as we make the history of the Comstock come alive with Voices from the Past, a walking tour of the Silver Terrace. Get down to Midtown. Midtown Matters. This is America, America Matters Media on AM 1180 KCKQ. A Lotus Broadcast Station. The, the power, power of radio, radio since 1967. 1967. Are you shy and don't want to talk on the air? Text us your questions or comments to 775-237-2266. Now back to the show. Hello, welcome back to Talking Truth to Power, Nevada's Freedom Talk Radio. I am your host, Brendan Trainer, and my co-host, Leland Fagri. And uh, in the news today, we had uh, the uh, capitulation, as it were, of Carrie Lam the head of uh, Hong Kong, who decided to not just suspend but withdraw the um, extradition treaty. Very interesting development. Yeah. Extremely interesting, yeah. Because, you know, ch uh, the Chinese are a, a saving face, shame culture, and so yes, anything exactly. that likes that is um, going to be, um, you know, significant for what she did. Right. And um, so, uh, you know, China doesn't want any more problems over there. They don't? No, I don't think so. <laughs> they want to try to contain it, but they don't want to use uh, excessive force. And, you know, frankly, I, I just have to say it. I'm not saying that this is totally controlled by the CIA and the, um, the uh, NGOs who are controlled by the CIA, but there's been a lot of that in there, if not uh, yeah, controlling so. it, at least directing it mm -hmm. and managing it. Yeah, I think so, too. Yeah. yeah. So there is some legitimate grievances. And then a lot of people don't realize that there were protests within the protests. Like you may have noticed pictures of uh, the Chinese youth carrying the British flag. Well, uh, they weren't really protesting against China and the, uh, the encroachment on the Hong Kong freedoms by China. They were protesting against England. 
<laughs> and they Oops. gathered outside the English embassy and, and protested. And the reason why they were protesting is because when China uh, took over Hong Kong, when the British ceded them after their 99-year lease, it ceded it to them, people had the choice of becoming Chinese citizens or not. And those who, who chose not to and didn't leave um, were called naturalized, uh, well, they were called uh, British subjects abroad. There's an official term. I don't know if I got it completely right. BSA. But, yeah. And yeah, so they were, um, they're sort of uh, in limbo. They have British Commonwealth status, but that does not mean that they can move to England and, and reside there. So they don't have absolute freedom. They're not full class British citizens. And that's what they were protesting about uh, as far as uh, they want the they want to become full-class British citizens, able to freely uh, travel to England and and reside there. So, uh, and but uh, you know, there's a lot of videos out there that uh, question whether or not this was really how populist and how popular this was. Um, for example, there's a a video that I've seen where the protest uh, protesters uh, were trashing. Uh, uh, subways. They were trashing the uh, subways trains. Mm -hmm. And one video, um, the people in one car uh, threw them out. And then they threatened them. They came back and tried to get back inside. And there was this one older man that um, had some kind of a stick or a weapon and he was wielding it back and forth and keeping them at bay. And uh, th I saw that at Kennedy Airport one time. <laughs> <laughs> but the, you know, the, 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 Protests are not all that popular with the mainstream Chinese people. I'm I'm not so sure that they would win an election uh, if they uh, had one. Um, and I think they would probably look uh, the ch the mainland residents would look at them as being spoiled. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And you know, China is an interesting place. You know, and we know it's communist in in a sense, but it's also capitalist. It's you like to call them fascist. They are. Yeah, I think they're, they, by definition, fascists. Yeah, so. and we really don't know that much about it. For example, you know, in the Soviet Union, you couldn't leave the Soviet Union, but right. many, many hundreds of thousands of Chinese travel abroad, travel. Yeah, yeah, and come back, and they willingly come back, mm -hmm. and uh, so they, there's some things that we just simply don't understand about China, and we're being constantly fed. Uh, this anti-Chinese line by the the, the hawks who, uh, you know, they think that China is going to dominate us. But in Latin America, for example, uh, most of the smaller Latin American countries are voluntarily turning to China for economic uh, development mm -hmm. rather than to the West. Yeah, the IMF it's been going on for some time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 So. Um, and then all this stuff about the Uyghurs, uh, we get conflicting information about what's really going on with the Uyghurs. I mean, are, are they really concentration camps? Are they being, you know, re-educated? Who is? Who I think is they it? are. Yeah, yeah I think they are. I, I don't think that's in dispute. But I, they, you know, they are in pursuit of empire, and this is a lot of people are in uh, sort of a denial state of their oh. their pursuit you know their interests and they've been it's a stealth empire that they've been building for years this michael this uh humphrey's book uh the thousand year war is a magnificent piece of work and there's another one out now called inside the common i was just looking at it now the inside the communist chinese drive for global supremacy so and these are not uh institutional hawks these these are just uh journalists that are looking at the evidence but what do you mean by global supremacy that's the thing well to the extent that they were seeking it with their their newfound wealth thanks to kissinger and company basically right. that's what that's what it was all about they 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 thought they could take the west's money uh -huh. and pursue empire with it Trump came along I and said, "Absolutely not." That I is still not have a happen. problem with the term empire. I know you do. I know because they've never been a real empire. They, they, you know. No, they, they were in pursuit of it. Yeah, yeah. That they seem to say, you know, of course, you know, there could be a stealth program that could be lying. I had the Fox News seems to have this one. Uh, Re, uh, Democratic Congresswoman, I think her name is Delaney, on all the time, and she says, "Well, the, you know, the Chinese are selling us goods cheap now, so they can raise the price later." I mean, these guys just don't know what competition is. No. <laughs> it's not in you know, the blood. It's not. It's not that blatant. Whatever they're doing, and right. they, 
the, they seem to be offering these countries um, a way to, uh, even Trump said, they're not, um, they're not sending their armies, they're sending their engineers. And that's, what, that, that's how they intended to do it. I mean, this new book, Inside Communist China's Drive for Global Supremacy, goes at that issue, that very issue, as to how they were uh, getting the technology to develop their empire, to, to in the infrastructure necessary to pursue empire. It's a great book. It's just uh, just been released here. So there's there's plenty more to come on this subject. Yeah. But I and there is probably an aspect of it that has resulted from the fact that Trump has laid down the gauntlet against them. But they were in pursuit of it prior to Trump, and there was nobody in their way prior to Trump. The Clinton Obama League of Globalists were not going to stand up to China. So this is a good development. This is not